Have I finally found an entry-level industrial 3D printer that does everything I need? Let's find out. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. For a couple of years now, I have been shopping for a new 3D printer, specifically in the entry-level industrial market. I'm looking for something that I can use to print large parts in ABS, nylon, and other engineering resins, and something that I can use to churn out production runs of hundreds of small parts for products that I sell. Now, none of the printers in the entry-level industrial space is perfect, but this one, the Chidi Tech iFast, looked interesting to me. So I reached out to Chidi Tech to ask some questions and they offered to send me a unit for review. So that's what we're gonna do today. I have spent the last six weeks putting this machine through its paces for my particular applications. And today I will share with you what I've learned. Now this is not going to be an endorsement saying that you should buy this printer for your application but I'll show you how it's working for my applications, and if you need to do something similar, this might be a good choice for you. Buckle up, this is gonna be a deep dive, and there are chapter marks if you wanna skip around. This is the Chidi Tech iFast, and the first thing that you will notice about it is it is very, very large. The overall width of this thing is about 28 inches, about 70 centimeters, and the overall height, once you have the filament feed on top, is about 36 inches, uh, maybe 90 centimeters. And then the depth of this thing is 500 centimeters or 20 inches just for the depth of the device. But by the time you add the filament feed options on the back, you can easily add another 12 inches if you use the hermetically sealed boxes. So you're looking at needing uh, 31 inches from the front of the printer back to a wall or about 8 a uh, hundred millimeters, about 80 centimeters. So this is not small and it weighs about a hundred pounds, which is what, you know, 40 kilos. It, it's not a light device and it is not a small device. Now for that bulk, you get a bunch of things with it. One is a relatively large build volume. The plate here says 360 by 250. I think in the manual they quote uh, 330 high by 250 millimeters by 320. And so it's a sizable build volume. It's bigger than your typical eight inch 200 millimeter printer. Uh, similar to the 12 inch 300 millimeter square I have, except it's not square, it's rectangular. Now this is a dual extruder printer. I believe there are options for a single extruder or a dual extruder. This is the dual extruder model and there are two different dual extruders. There's a low temperature extruder with brass nozzles that will go up to 240 degrees Celsius. And then there is a high temperature version that has hardened steel nozzles that works for 250 degrees Celsius and up. Highest I printed with this is 280 for nylon so far, but they quote other materials at 300, 350 Celsius. I don't know what the highest temperature is. Their marketing materials on that are not super clear. It has a magnetic build plate and it comes with, at least the one that I got came with two different materials. It has a typical kind of build tack style material that is great for printing PLA. I did a little bit of testing with the roll of PLA they sent me. It sticks beautifully and peels off, you know, when you flex the plate when the print is cold. For ABS though, I prefer the pebbled surface PEI plate. And this thing is just magical. At 110 degrees Celsius, the ABS sticks to it firmly. You'd probably break the print trying to tear it off. And then as it cools, you hear it cracking. And when it's, when it's cold, you can barely even take the plate out. Even just doing that with the plate will usually send your model sliding off into the back of the printer. In any case, just a slight flex and it pops out. And I actually bought a second plate with my own money, went out to Amazon and bought another one. Um, they have them available for their, through their store for about $40, which is you know pretty typical for something like this. Um, and I did that for production printing so that I can pull out a plate of parts while it's still hot and still firmly stuck. And I can throw another plate in, close the door and start a print and not even have to go through the full preheat cycle because the printer itself and the aluminum heat bed are already up to temperature. 
And speaking of the aluminum heat bed, this is the heat bed. And of course it's set with magnets in it and it actually has a PC board heater with an integrated thermistor on the bottom if you stick your head in there and look up. And in my experience, this is really, really even. All the printers that I have experience with have glass beds and I've got one with a PC board heater, I've got one with an industrial silicone heater and they just cannot achieve the evenness that you can get with an aluminum bed. Uh, looking at this thing with a thermal camera and looking at it with uh, an infrared thermometer with the plate on here, with it heated to temperature, it is within about two degrees Celsius from the very center all the way out to the corners. And what that means is that unlike my other printers that drop off 10 or 20 degrees out at the edges, you can actually print parts all the way to the edge and they adhere securely and pop off. And then of course with the enclosed chamber, you don't have drafts that cause parts to cool unevenly warp and peel off the bed. And speaking of the enclosed chamber, this chamber is actively heated. There is a small intake fan in here and there's some kind of uh, an electrical resistive heater in the back. You can kind of see the fins of an aluminum heat sink if you look down into this port up here. It draws air in, blows hot air out the top and heats the chamber. And this will go to 80 degrees Celsius. The marketing materials on the website say 60 degrees Celsius, but the presets they sent say 80 and it gets to 80, no problem. Of course, when it's initially printing, it starts with the bed all the way up. So you only have to heat the volume up on top of the bed. And so it doesn't even start the heater until the print starts. After it's preheated, this raises up and then it starts and just within a minute, the volume at the top here is up to 80 degrees Celsius and it maintains that throughout the print. Now the other thing that's nice about having a fully enclosed build area is it does have circulation fans with filters on them. I know nothing about the technology of the filters. What I do know is I have been printing with inexpensive ABS filament. I've just been running my typical eSun ABS with the door closed, with the thing printing, I cannot smell anything. With my other printers, if I walk in the room, especially if the door's been closed, I can smell the ABS. With this, I have not been able to smell the ABS at all. It just, you know, the first couple times the printer heats up, you kind of smell the, the, the smell of new hot electronics, but the filtration, however it works, I can't smell it outside the printer and I count that as a big win. Now, the fact that it does have that enclosed chamber and the heater is part of the reason why the printer is so large. It also makes it very difficult to film this thing. So you will not see many clips in this video of it actually printing because there's nothing to see. The bed is all the way up here, so you can't shoot in through the window. And if you look in from the top, all you see is the top of the extruder moving around. You can't even see the print. It does have a webcam in it, and I will put some clips in of the webcam showing the prints. Um, again, it, the angles are difficult because the extruder is so large, there's very little to see. The webcam is not fully integrated into the device. It is just an inexpensive webcam that they have slapped in here that has its own app and allows you to monitor what's happening. Not great, but it works. Uh, memory and storage is all handled with a USB stick. It comes with a USB stick uh, that you put in here. You either put your files on it and then and walk them over to the printer, or you can just leave it plugged in and upload files over the network. Because I plan to just leave it in, I went and bought a small 32 gig USB stick that I can just leave in the front of the printer and it's not sticking out, so I'm not risking knocking it off every time I walk by. Now this printer does come with a couple of different filament feed options. You take off the top cover, which you'll leave this off for printing things like PLA, uh, low temperature materials, but if you need to retain the heat or use the heated chamber, you definitely need the top cover. And the filament feeds in, there are notches in the back of the top cover and the filament feeds in through the back. There are two passageways for the filament to come in and these do have filament sensors so if the filament breaks or runs out, in theory, you can restart a failed print. It'll stop automatically. Have not even tried it. Um, I generally don't mess with that. I just make sure I have enough filament. And there are stands on the back here for rolls of filament. The filament then feeds into a PTFE tube down to the extruder. Now this is optional. 
If you're printing with things that are not moisture sensitive, you can just drape it across with PLA. It's no big deal and it just kind of tugs on it as it runs, everything's fine. The point of the PTFE tubing is to prevent moisture from getting to the filament. And they include, with the printer, at least the one that I got, a couple of these hermetic feed boxes. So these are just boxes with little roller bearings down in the bottom and a packet of desiccant. So you can just stick a roll of filament in here with the desiccant, close it up, and there's a rubber band to seal the gap. And then it feeds out through a four millimeter or two millimeter inside diameter uh, PTFE tube. Now they have brackets. They intend for you to mount this on the back of the printer with about three inches of tubing feeding right into the filament sensor. Because the thing is so deep, I didn't want to try to put those on the back, so I went and just bought some longer pieces of PTFE tubing so I can just set it over here on the side. So I have a roll of carbon fiber nylon here feeding through the tube up into the right-hand extruder here. And that seems to work pretty well. The idea being that you can leave the filament sitting here and it is not exposed to humidity in the air. It's in a dry box and it's entirely contained all the way up to the print head in the printer. Let's take a closer look at the extruder. This is the dual extruder mechanism from the Chidi Tech iFast. I got two extruders with my printer, a high temperature one and a low temperature one. I'm not sure if every printer comes with both, but these are available separately. You can buy this entire assembly that has the stepper motor drives, the cooling fans, the hot ends and everything for, I think right now they're about $150 a piece. So you can buy the, hot, the high temperature, the low temperature, uh, either one pretty inexpensively when you consider what's in here. So this is a typical dual extruder setup. You can see the stepper motors down in there and the hot ends. The heat blocks have silicone insulators around them. This, is, this one has brass nozzles. The high temperature extruder has hardened steel nozzles. And then we've got a pair of 25 millimeter fans for cooling the heat brakes and a pair of blowers with nozzles for cooling the print. And these are all controllable separately. These ones are thermostatically controlled, so they come on when the hot ends are hot. And these ones are controlled by software for cooling the print. And then the whole assembly connects using a little PC board connector in the back, and there's a flexible ribbon cable that snaps in, and then these two threaded inserts and this padded little uh, um, surface here is for a little clip that then holds those flex cables as a strain relief. The front of this comes off so we can see what's inside. Just pull off these two thumb screws and you do have to pull off these thumb screws to replace the extruder. That gives you access to the mounting screws on top and the mounting screws go into these three holes back here and these two holes here. So up top, we've just got some push to connect four millimeter fittings for the uh, tubes to carry the filament. In this case, I just have the filament stuck in there because this is ABS and doesn't require them. And then you can see these are dual drive extruders. So you've got a drive gear on this side with gear teeth, and then there's a spring loaded gear on the other side with teeth that engage with it, and so it drives the filament from both sides. And that is pretty much all there is to it, except for the cam mechanism. Now, this printer actually raises and lowers the nozzles. You can see in this position, the number one nozzle is lowered and the number two nozzle is raised. And so to adjust those, what it does is it moves all the way across and strikes this cam bar on the frame on the other side and that switches the nozzles. So now this one is down, number two is down, and number one is raised up so that it's not dragging on the print. And when it's ready to switch nozzles, it just goes to the other side of the chamber, presses up against the frame, and swaps back. So during the print, it can swap back and forth between those two nozzles. Now, this is not a precision mechanism. This cam, you can see, is just riding on these bearings, and it's just a spring, and it just pushes the nozzles around. Turns out though, that's fine because as long as it comes down to a repeatable position, then you can have the offset set in software and you don't have to have a precisely controllable or adjustable position. It just has to be repeatable. 
Now, during my testing, I did end up in a situation where it started rattling and buzzing and making a lot of extra noise, and there was some, there was some clunking when it got over to the side of the, of the chamber. And what I determined was ultimately just these little thumb screws that are in here, one of them had come loose. And so it was sticking out and the tolerances are close enough that it was actually hitting the side of the chamber and flexing the plastics and making a clunking noise. And then as it was printing, because it wasn't tight, it was vibrating and making noise, tightening down that little thumb screw completely solved the issue. So if your printer starts buzzing or thumping or clunking, you might check these screws and just make sure that they're tight. The printer comes with a free slicer called Cheaty Print, and it looks to me like it's just a reskinned version of Cura. Those of you who use Cura can uh, confirm or deny that. That's what it looks like to me. And the basic settings that come with it for this printer are very, very good. I have had zero issues with it. You can just uh, plug it in, turn it on, and you will get quality prints out of the device. You can also control it at a tremendous level of depth. If you turn up the level of the settings, you can access every last detail. You don't have to, but if you want to, it is all there. And I have had great success tuning this for very fast print speeds for production or for very high quality for multi-material prints. Um, the way it comes is the slicer is just on the USB stick. I usually totally ignore software packaged in the so with the hardware and I go to the website and download the latest version. If you do that, the version that's out there, at least as of this moment, does not appear to support the iFast printer. You have to use the one off of the memory stick. And then once you do that, it immediately checks for updates and there are lots of updates and beta versions available. In fact, over the six weeks of my testing, I probably installed three new beta updates. So it is in active development. If you go to the extensions menu, there is an option here for a control panel, and this opens the control panel software for the printer. And this is just your typical remote network control panel for a 3D printer. It lets you drive it around, lets you preheat uh, the, the printer, uh, it lets you upload files, start and control prints, and it has a nice temperature graph. The thing that is missing here is it does not have the integrated webcam. And the reason for that is that the webcam hardware is not integrated into the printer. It is just a third party off the shelf webcam that they shoved in here. And uh, so you get a webcam in your printer, you can download the iCookie Cam app for it and you can access it. Uh, it does appear to work remotely, so it must be using some kind of internet service. There's not a lot of details. It's not great. You can actually just power off the webcam from the front panel of the printer if you don't want to use it. Now the printer is controlled with a touch screen. It has a number of features in it. Uh, right up front, you can turn the lights off and on in the device and you can turn the sound off and on. And there's also a switch here to turn the webcam on and off as well. Uh, in the menus down the side, the first one here is the file explorer, and you can go through and look at all the files that are here on the device, and you can select one. You see a picture of it, and you can start a print or delete the file from here. Um, firmware is also in here, and so when you upload the firmware files, these are here. If I hit print, it'll actually flash that firmware. I don't know which version that is. I don't want to do that at the moment. Um, but uh, this just allows you basic uh, navigation and printing. You can also do this remotely. On the settings menu, you have your basic manual control of the device. You can drive the head around, you can home it, you can uh, you know, raise and lower the bed. Um, you can control preheating. So you've got the heated plate, the two extruders, and the heated chamber. And for every one of these, you just hit the button to turn it on and hit the left and right arrows to toggle the temperature up and down. The filament menu here is for loading. Turn the filament sensor on and off. And again, you can turn the extruders on and off, and then you have up and down arrows to feed and retract the filament. Once you have it to temperature, when you hit retract, it will jam a bunch of filament rapidly into the hot end to try to purge it and then reverse to pull it out. So it's gonna to try to do uh, a type of a cold pull to extract as much filament as possible when you retract. 
to change the temperatures. You can't do that here, but you can go back to the preheating menu and toggle the temperature up and down and then come back and continue working on the filament. And there's a couple of other options in here for bed leveling and calibration. We'll come back to those in a minute. And then you have uh, basic settings. You can swap between the single and dual extruder. You can adjust the touch screen, um, touch sensitivity, factory reset, um, information about the device. This is you know the current positions and temperatures and firmware versions. I'm running uh, version 3.28 of the firmware, though every version of the firmware they've given me has been version 3.28 and the Blue Plus 1.8 UI. Now the wireless is showing as zeros here, uh, but if you look at it elsewhere, there's a number, so I don't know exactly what's going on there. Then you have some nice notes about uh, support. Now, ultimately, there is a sticker on the front of the printer with three different email or a couple of different email addresses for support, plus a Skype ID for support. And then around the end of the printer, there are actually QR codes on a sticker for support. So they are very forward about how to contact them. There's no question about how to reach them. Now the printer does not actually have auto bed leveling, but the manual bed leveling actually works really well. It's here in the uh, gear settings menu. You can go to leveling and you have two options. Fast leveling, which just sets the Z offsets, or normal leveling, which runs the whole leveling cycle. We're gonna choose normal leveling and click the start button, enter into leveling mode. Now what it's gonna do is home the device and move to the first position. So it's homing the head now, and then it will, it will home the bed, which homes at the bottom, and then raise that up to the top. Now it's raised the bed all the way to the top and it's positioned the extruder one nozzle right over the bed and then they provide a piece of material to use as a feeler gauge. This just feels like a piece of build tack and you can just reach over, reach underneath and feel it and adjust the knob underneath the printer here in this corner to adjust the level of this corner. Then you just hit the button and it will move to the next corner and you can reach in and feel and adjust the knob on that corner and then finally it will move to the back of the bed and then you can use the feeler to adjust the third knob located at the back. Now that gets you the bed level and then the next thing you have to set are the Z offsets. So it will now move to the center of the bed and place extruder one down close to the bed. I can use the same feeler gauge and I can adjust the bed up and down with the plus and minus buttons here on the control panel. Then hit the next button and it will switch to the extruder number two and we can do exactly the same thing. And what this is doing is actually storing the relative calibrations for the two Z nozzles. So in this case, I've got, this is Z2 calibration minus 1.8 millimeters because I previously set this and it keeps a separate calibration for each nozzle so that when it switches, it raises or lowers the bed so that you don't have to mechanically get the nozzles in the same plane, it does it electronically. And then when you're done, confirm and adjustment completed. Now that covers adjusting the Z axis, both the leveling of the bed to get it planar and then also the offsets of the two nozzles. But you also have to have X and Y offsets for the two nozzles so that you can line them up for multi-material prints. Now, instead of trying to line them up perfectly mechanically, they instead have uh, an extruder calibration to do that. So there is a print job that comes with the device on the card, and that's this PLAE calibration, and it prints two sets of scales with two materials, and they're at slightly different pitches. And so based on which of the uh, graduations on these scales line up, you know which direction you need to move the offset value. So you print this first and then come into the settings here and choose calibrate E. Now this has a representation here of the print job in Y and X and if you look closely you can see that the outer scale is at a wider pitch than the inner scale. Ideally the center line right next to Y and right next to X should line up but if it doesn't you can come in here and you can move it um, 
five hundredths of a millimeter at a time until it lines up. Now in practice, when I printed this the very first time, it wasn't even close, it wasn't even on this scale, and I could look at it and see, oh, that needs to go a whole millimeter. I just moved it a whole millimeter, printed the job again, and then they were much closer, and then I made my fine adjustments, printed again to confirm. And so you can do this as many times as you need to walk it in, and so I've got my X set, I've got my Y set here, offset 1.55. Now this is the offset from the sort of ideal if the mechanics were perfect as designed. And once you get these set, you just click save, and now the extruders are aligned. And when you print two material prints, everything will line up. It's actually a pretty slick little system. Well, let's talk about print quality because I'm sure that's what you're all here to see. This is the Benchy that came pre-sliced on the uh, memory card with the device. And this is printed in the roll of red PLA that came with the printer. And unsurprisingly, it looks really good. I mean, I don't know what you would expect if you can't get the pre-sliced model with the pre-packaged PLA that came with the device to look good, then you probably don't have any business making a 3D printer. So, you know, this is nice and clean. The overhangs are nice. The bridging is nice. Um, it's, a, it's a good, clean print. And for an initial test of the device, this is pretty good. But I'm not particularly interested in PLA. It tends to be too brittle for the applications that I want to use a 3D printer for. So let's take a look at a more difficult uh, material, ABS. Now aside from some initial test prints, this is the part that I really wanted to try to tune. This is a PC board mount for the electronic lead screw and I print hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. On my previous printers, the most that I could get to print in a single print bed is six. And so I could get six of these laid out on the bed and I could print those in about two hours. If I tried to print more than that, then I got out near the edges of the bed and they peeled off. But with the iFast, I was able to get 12 of these on the bed, print them in three and a half hours, which is faster than my other printers, but also more productive because I can get 12 of them at once. So I have to change the, uh, the print job, actually take the parts off the printer and reload it half as often. So I am super impressed with this and I did a few things to make this run fast. I increased the layer height to get it to run faster. I increased the print speed. These are printing at about 100, maybe 120 millimeters a second. I'm not sure where I ended up. And I also just eliminated everything that wasn't needed. You can see there are some gaps here and that was intentional. I turned off the thin wall gap fill and that cut the print time in half. So this is a perfectly functional part and I can churn these out very, very rapidly. So on that front, I'm very satisfied with the printer and the bed adhesion all the way out to the edges was excellent. So that done, I wanted to see if I could print large parts. So just for reference, this is a box. This is eight inches long, and this is one that I printed on my other printer. And you can see that there is a great big crack in it. This is the best I could do with ABS in a part this size. And if you look at the bottom of it, you can see it is not even close to flat. There is a huge gap there, and it rocks on the surface. And here is my first attempt to print exactly the same part on the iFast. And you can see there is no rock at all. There are no cracks. And the bottom of this thing is just perfectly flat. There are just, if I don't squeeze it, there are just no gaps here at all. This thing came out perfectly flat on the printer, adhered the first try. And because of the heated chamber, the stress doesn't build up in the part. So I was expecting it to be pulling up at the ends and actually bending or pulling the magnets uh, off of the bed, but it didn't do that. It just sat there completely flat. And then as the print cooled, it cracked and I could just pull it right off the bed. No dramas at all. And it came off completely flat. So that is a huge win for the heated chamber. So I also attempted some multi-material prints. This is the first one that I tried. This is a switch plate for the, uh, for the Avid CNC router. I've got a big toggle switch and it's not labeled. Several people pointed that out. And so this is a plate to go under the power switch with zero and one. 
and I actually extruded the text all the way through, but you can see on the bottom, it's a little squished and it's really indistinct. And the reason for that is I've got a real elephant's foot thing going on with this uh, particular part. And you can see that it, I had the Z height too low and it really squished out. And then I immediately turned around and printed another one without any changes. And you can see it doesn't have that elephant's foot. And in fact, it's much, much cleaner. That's the top, or that's the bottom, compared to this on the, uh, on the previous part. And then the top is uh, relatively clean as well. Uh, pretty comparable. And the difference here is that I printed it once and then turned around and printed it again. The printer, when I got it, had a defect in the firmware that caused subsequent jobs to print higher. And that's why this one ended up clean where the other one had a big elephant's foot. That has since been fixed with a firmware update. Given that I had some success with some small parts, I wanted to try some larger parts. This is an ER32 collet holder. Now I've printed a bunch of these on my previous printer to go in drawers and hold collets. And I could not print these in ABS on my other printers because the warp was just too great. But as you can see, this thing is just completely flat and it came right off the printer completely flat. And again, that's the heated chamber that makes that possible. Now, I do have a little bit of kind of goobers in the, the, the lettering. You can see it's sort of squished down. And I played around with this for a little bit, trying to figure out exactly what was going on. I ultimately determined that the issue is combing. The printer by default, or the settings in the slicer by default, try to move within the surface of the part so that it doesn't cross the perimeter so you don't wipe off ooze. But what that does on a multi-material print like this is if you've got the white extruder and you're moving from one place to another, it's gonna drag it in contact with the black plastic. And so you end up with this kind of smearing effect and sort of indistinct lettering. So I turned combing off and instead replaced it with a Z-hop, and you can see that I get a much, much better, uh, a much, much better surface with no smearing or mixing of the plastics. And that's because instead of dragging across the print to move from location to location, it's actually retracting the filament, lifting up two tenths of a millimeter, moving, dropping back down, repriming, and making the making the extrusion. And you can see the result is much, much cleaner. And I've also got text here in the end of the part, and you can see that that came out pretty clean as well. There's a little bit of smearing of the colors, but you, know, you look at this at a distance and you would never know that it's there. It's a very nice, clean, multi-material print. The alignment is excellent. And again, you've got basically zero warp because of the heated chamber. Now in terms of ooze performance, this is the prime pillar that I used on this device. And you can see kind of how much ooze was here. I did not use an ooze shield. I only used the prime pillar because the prime pillar was gonna get printed first. And because of the geometry of this particular print, um, this was the first thing that it hit and the ooze wiped off on the side. And you can see that there's just a little bit of ooze with each layer. It came off cleanly on the prime pillar and everything looks good. I also printed this multicolor vase. This is just a model off of Thingiverse, and this is one of the test prints that I typically use when I'm trying to tune a multi-material print. Now you can see that I did get some smearing. There's a couple of things that are happening here. There's a little bit of black smearing into the white. Any place with the white smeared into the black, you don't really see it. But you can also see that there are some voids in here. And what was happening with this is that I think this is because of the combing. Again, because the extruder is dragging along the top surface to move from place to place, it's actually losing some plastic. So in the white, you could see that a little bit of white was being pulled out as it drug across the black. And that, I think, ended up causing it to lose its prime. And so then it took a moment before it started extruding again. Now, I have not printed another one of these since I discovered the Z-Hop and turned that setting on but other multi-material prints that I have attempted, and you'll see another one here in a minute, just don't have this problem. So I think that was due to the combing. And again, I used the ooze shield on this and looking at the outside of this thing, 
you can kind of get an idea of how much ooze was coming out of the nozzles. It turns down the temperature on the off nozzle, and you can see there's really not a lot there. There's just, with each layer, that's about how much ooze is out of the nozzle that's not being used, and because it's lifted up, it doesn't end up scraping off on the part. Only when that nozzle is dropped and it starts printing again do you actually get that wiped off, so the ooze shield ends up taking all of that out. And finally, the acid test. This is, if you saw a video I did about a year ago, this is the uh, nose for my drill press. And this is to hold the controls for a VFD to replace the simple start and stop switch that was there. And this part was very, very difficult to print and get flat on my other printers. I ultimately could not print it in ABS. It, it was just a non-starter. I'd get a half an inch up and the thing would already pop off the bed. Um, I ended up printing it in PETG and even that was very, very difficult. So I figured this would be the acid test of whether the heated chamber actually works. And lo and behold, it does. This was my very first attempt and you can see it just came out perfectly flat. This is the surface that was on the printer. It printed in this orientation. And this was, I intentionally ran this with a really fine, this is just 0.2 millimeter layers, and I did not worry about trying to make this fast at all. This ended up taking about 23 hours because I, I could have made it run faster with thicker layers, but I wanted an acid test of the warping behavior, so I wanted a very long print. This was more than 24 hours, and as you can see, it just came out completely flat. There is no rock in this part whatsoever. This also used support material, so there was, it was built with this edge down, so there was support in all of this, support uh, built up out of the same black ABS, and it just popped off cleanly, and you can see that the result is just tremendous. This is just an amazing, an amazing piece. I had no idea you could do stuff like this in ABS, but the heated chamber just makes all the difference in the world. I did not use an ooze shield with this. I printed it only with a prime tower, and you can see how much ooze scraped off on the prime tower. It really was that clean. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned at this and very, very pleased. This alone, I think, is a testament to the print quality that this printer is capable of. I also did some testing with carbon fiber nylon, and this is the Chidi Tech version. This is their uh, PA12 carbon fiber, prints at 280 degrees Celsius with the high temperature extruder, and you can see the results here are very, very clean. The top is really nice and smooth. Of course, the bottom that sat down on the, on the bed is really clean. Uh, for bed adhesion on this, I just used some uh, glue stick on the direct, the PVP glue stick directly on the pebbled uh, PEI surface. It wouldn't stick well enough to the PEI itself. I mean, it printed, and for small parts, you could get away with it, but um, it would peel off pretty easily. But you can see this is, again, just very, very nice and flat. No issues at all. It printed and popped off the bed cleanly. And you can see I put some brass inserts, threaded inserts into this. And again, the dimensions on this were right on. Even those inside holes were exactly the size that I modeled, and the inserts just went in beautifully. This is the encoder mount for my lathe electronic lead screw, also printed in the PA12 carbon fiber. And again, the quality of the print with this stuff is just stunning. I mean, you can see that top surface, just how smooth and flat that is. Again, this was printed with the Z-Hop, and this required support material. So a built-up support material on top of this part, and you can see that just snapped away cleanly, and on the underside of the top here, and you can see that snapped away completely. In fact, I have all of the support material right here, and I was just stunned, especially with the layer up here on the top. After pulling out, you know, just pulling out the flexible stuff that was in the middle, this layer was on there, and all I had to do is get a fingernail under it, and it just peeled right off in one piece, nice and clean, and you can see that the surface it left on the underside is just beautiful. I, I was stunned. I thought I was gonna have to use dissolvable support with this. I did play around with some dissolvable support, trying the ionic material, and for the life of me, the ionic is just too sticky, and it swells, and it will not feed 
in the dual extruder, at least in the high temperature extruder that you have to use if you're printing the, the carbon fiber nylon in the other side. So I don't know, I, I'm, I have a roll of the Chidi Tech S-Green on order. That's their support material that they intend to use with the carbon fiber nylon, and I will give that a try when it comes. But in terms of the Matter Hackers Ionic, it will not print through this printer at all. I just could not make it work. I also printed one of these. This is, of course, the uh, grinder for grinding tungstens that I made in a previous video. I knew that the surface finish was nice on this, all except this place where I scratched it, trying to get the support material out of these threaded holes. That was a little bit of a bear, but uh, I scratched it a little bit. But other than that, the surface finish on this is outstanding. And I didn't realize how good it was until I put it next to the one that I printed on my other printer. And compared to this, the nice smooth finish on this, this is just gnarly. Putting these side by side, you can really see the quality difference between the two. And oh my goodness, the iFast on the right is just, I mean, it's, it is a different material, right? This is the um, Chidi Tech uh, PA12 carbon fiber compared to, uh, I'm not sure exactly which one this is, but the 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 print quality is just night and day difference and you can see just from the reflections the bottom of this one is definitely warped if i put something against it you can see there's a huge gap underneath whereas the one that came off of the ifas is just completely flat i'm i just continue to be amazed and i printed another part this is from my old 3d printer extruder uh, design. This is the extruder block for my dual extruder model. And this was just completely full of support material. And again, it just broke away beautifully. This is PA12. This is carbon fiber, not reinforced nylon. And this is just how it came off the printer aside from poking the support material out of the holes. I just continue to be amazed with the print quality I'm getting off of this thing. It's uh, way better than any of the other printers that I've been using and tuning for the last seven years. Let's take a moment here and talk about software quality. It's not great. I've been in the software industry for about 30 years and this device has all of the hallmarks of software developed in a low cost geography. It is good enough to get the job done, but it is just good enough to get the job done. It has lots of rough edges and in the six weeks of testing I've done with this device, I've run into half a dozen issues that were attributable to either the firmware in the device or the software. Now to their credit, and as is typical with offshore software development, I sent email to support and they responded immediately with a new version that fixed that issue. So flashing the firmware in this is really easy. You just get a file, you put it on the flash drive and you print it as though it were a print job. It takes just a few seconds and it updates the device. But I have had to update the device several times in the testing that I've done. And I kind of made a list of some of the things that I ran into. When I first got the device, it has a dual nozzle extruder but the UI did not have the feature to actually set the Z offset for the two nozzles. I asked about it and they sent me new firmware that fixed it. The next thing I ran into is that uh, the Z offset was creeping a little bit between prints. So I would set it, the first print would be exactly where I set the Z offset, and then second print and all the prints after that would print just a little bit higher. Not much, but enough that it affected the first layer. So I sent them email and they immediately sent me a new firmware file that fixed it. Flashed that and the printer immediately started homing in the wrong direction. So instead of homing towards the switch, it would home in the other direction and crash. Emailed them and they said, oh, that's the wrong firmware. And they sent me another version of the firmware that fixed that and fixed the Z homing issue. And this is kind of how it's been. Now, every firmware file they've sent me has been version 3.28 with exactly the same file name and exactly the same size. The checksums are different, so it's different firmware, but it's pretty clear that their configuration management and version control is also not great. So just kind of understand what you're getting into with a device like this. This is not a solid, stable, polished product. This product is still under development. As you've seen, it works great, but I have had to contact support several times and to their credit, they've always been happy to help me and they've always had a fix. Now there is one remaining software irritation that they do not have a fix for, 
and that is while you are uploading files to the flash stick on the device over the network, you cannot touch the control panel. The most natural thing in the world is to finish slicing, send the file to the device, and then during the minute or so it takes to upload, to come over and get the printer set up, like do things like Z uh, offset checking, stuff like that. Don't do it, because if you do, it gets partway through the download, and then the head takes off, starts moving around erratically. You can hear the motors skipping steps, crashing into the end stops. I emailed them about this, and they just told me this is a limitation of the device. Don't try to interact with the control panel while the file is uploading. It's a weird thing, but you know, as long as you just don't do that, the printer works fine. Now, my problem is it's the most natural thing in the world to start prepping the printer while the file uploads, so I keep forgetting, but eventually I will probably learn. It's conclusion time. Should you buy this printer? Well, that is a question that I cannot answer for you. I can only talk about my experience in my application. Uh, I have found this to be very reliable for long production runs of lots of parts. You can fill the entire bed and it will print them reliably over and over and over again. Thermal control is excellent. The heated bed is even within a couple of degrees Celsius all the way out to the corners. And of course the heated chamber makes printing in materials like ABS just amazing. Something that you just cannot do on an open printer. Uh, and the performance with ABS is just outstanding. I mean, you've, you've seen some of these parts. There is no way I could have produced this part on any other printer that I've ever owned. Uh, ooze control with multi-material printing is good for certain materials. For ABS, it is excellent. The, the way it drops the temperature when it switches nozzles, you get maybe a few millimeters of ooze, the nozzle is lifted, it's out of the way, it's not an issue, and it wipes off on the prime tower or the ooze shield. And so ooze control has been excellent. A lot better even than the E3D V6 hot ends in my other printer. I've been impressed with how well it does. So is it worth the $2,500 price tag? Well, there are a lot of printers in this segment and I have spent a lot of time pouring over data sheets for them and there isn't one of them that's perfect. Nearly every printer in this segment is missing something important. Um, they will not have an actively heated chamber. In fact, this is one of the very few on the market that does, unless you get up into the high-end Stratasys offerings. Um, some of the printers have no, they have everything else that I want, but no magnetic build plate. They're printing on glass. Uh, or you'll have a printer that has all of those features, but it has a small build area. Um, or it'll have a good generous build area, but won't have hardened nozzles available or an extruder that can handle materials that are abrasive like carbon fiber. Or it'll be two to three times this price. So the drawback on this one, of course, is it doesn't have the auto bed leveling. But in my experience testing with it, it's been fine. I can set the bed level once. I can check the Z offset occasionally. It has not wandered uh, now that that firmware fix is there and uh, it seems to be working great. So while I thought that was gonna be a big drawback, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. So would I pay $2,500 to buy another one of these when my capacity needs increase? I think I probably would. My experience with it's been great. You know, software's weak, but the hardware's good and uh, the support's been good, I, I think I would pay that money up for this printer for my particular application. Is it right for your application? Yeah, that's a decision that you're gonna have to make. So one note is I did see that the Prusa XL is gonna be out later this year, and I did place a deposit to get one, primarily in the hopes that the IDEX style or the tool change style head would help to control the ooze. Now that I've seen how well this printer controls ooze with the materials that I'm using, I might rethink that because again, that's a nice printer, at least it looks like it's going to be, but it doesn't have an actively heated build chamber. So for large parts in ABS, it's just not really gonna have that capability. So that's something I'm gonna have to think about. Well, that's all I've got for you today. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.